Hello. All right. I'll give it a start. Um, you might have seen the link in the um, chat window from uh, Saravana, where you can um, have some discussion. Um, I'll try to read it up afterwards. Um, please understand that I'm not able to read everything during this presentation. Um, but anyway, um, I'm Sam. I'm from Belgium, for who um, of you who don't know me. I'm living in Belgium, um, work as CTO in uh, Codeit. Um, we are doing nothing but Microsoft integration, so that's obviously mostly with uh, BizTalk Server. But in the past four years, I would say, we started with um, Azure and yeah, invested a lot of time and a lot of um, effort in that. Um, first of all, thanks for uh, Michael and Saravana for uh, having me. Um, I also have to say thank you from my wife because um, this time I don't have to travel to uh, UK, so I don't have to spend all the time uh, on the train and travel and uh, in the bars. Eh? So thank you from uh, from her. Um, and I think it's a great idea this integration Monday. Um, I remember when I was in June in in UK, there was like I don't know 20, maybe 30 people uh, on the on the physical meeting, and now we can see that there's 100 to 200 people in in these. Um, online events from all over the world. So I think it's a, it's a big success, success and I hope that, yeah, it can keep going, you know, having all these uh, nice, interesting subjects and then hopefully good speakers. Um, what I'll be talking about today is mostly um, about this new concept, microservices, and um, a little shout out to uh, Charles Young last week. I think he did a great job in positioning the concepts of microservices and, and the the way he sees it and, and sees it becoming a part of um, yeah, the architecture that, that might be the future. Um, what I'll try to do is, is continue on his, um, yeah, where, where he set the scene, I'll try to um, continue and dive a little bit deeper um, on the concepts and the details that we have seen um, on the Integrate 2014 event. So I'll do a little bit on the reasoning why they did the microservices. I'll show a little early preview and that's screenshot only on the BizTalk microservices portal, do a little um, walkthrough of the mockup, how you can create and add um, uh, microservices. Um, and then I'll do more of a technical deep dive. Most of that content um, is taken from the Integrate event, but I'll try to position it more um, you know, with, with my integration view uh, and dive a little bit deeper in that on the, in the end where I'll share my thoughts. And also because I saw that last week that some people were, were wondering what they could do to prepare themselves, um, I tried to, to give an answer on that in, in, let's say, the last slides, okay? So what we've been seeing that, you know, the typical traditional integration, that's, that's something that's not new for everyone, I'm, I'm sure of that, where you have the typical on-prem um, BizTalk Hub sitting in between all these applications. You can see that is getting a um, little bit new and that's changing. You can see that more modern app integrations um, have other things. We can see it's um, not only on-prem anymore, you have um, a lot of companies moving to sales, you have the B2B parts, um, and that's where Microsoft wants to give an answer on. If we look at this slide, um, I think we can learn two things. First of all, we can see that hybrid integration is, is an important thing. And what we also can see is that um, it seems that Northwind might be um, replaced by Tailspin Air. That was the first time I saw that company name, one of those uh, many fictitious company names that Microsoft officially registered. Um, so Tailspin Air is probably a new one that we can uh, keep on hearing about. Now, anyway, this is the slide that um, Charles showed last week, and that's where everything started. That's the first slide ever we saw where um, BizTalk microservices was mentioned. Um, and that's where the tweets started. That's where everything started. Um, all the people on that event, um, you know, um, tweeted about it. That's where um, journalists started to read blogs and all of that. Um, and one of the big um, misperceptions at that time was that BizTalk microservices or Azure microservices was some kind of a product name or a brand or something. Um, and 
some people from the product team explicitly said that it's not a real official brand or whatever, or it's not an official Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Azure um, service. It's more of an architecture where everything is um, will be built upon around these um, yeah that ecosystem. Yeah. Um, what's important is that um, they try to use uh, microservices as the architectural approach. And if we take the definition from Martin Fowler's um, website, let's say the, the guy who um, is probably most known um, for that, we can take some things out of that and map that to the, um, uh, to the, to the implementation that Azure tries to give on, on microservices. So what we see, it's an approach to develop a single application, but as a suite, as a suite of small services. So you can combine a lot of small services and build a, a larger application with that. What's also very important is that every one of those services is running in its own process, and they are communicating with each other and using lightweight mechanisms. And you will see that that's um, mostly um, used as HTTP. So that's where REST and all of that comes in, 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 into place. And each of them is running in their own process. That's also something that's important for uh, later on. These services, um, they are built around business capabilities. That's also one that we will see coming back. And they are independently deployed by typically an automated deployment. What's also important is that there's just a bare minimum of centralized management. So everything that we know from message box is kept as a minimum and as lightweight as possible. And very important, and that's what we see with um, with everything around Azure, is that um, it's open and it's support for different programming languages. So it's not only restricted to Xlang, C Sharp. XAML, whatever. No, you can use um, uh, Node.js and, 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 and PHP, whatever that's, um, that, that can be used to um, build and deploy um, APIs. Okay? So that's the thing. If we then make a mapping between those concepts and what the implementation on Azure will be, but there we can see it's an application of small services. That's what, what um, the definition said. And if you look at Azure, there we can see you can compose and you will be able to build a business application from the gallery. So you will have a gallery with microservices and you will be able to build and compose that. They run their own process and their own lightweight communication. And the answer of that in Microsoft uh, Azure is that they will use Azure websites and the HTTP gateway um, for the communication between all those microservices. So that's important to understand. Um, I know that Docker was mentioned last week, and, and that was also my perception in the very first beginning because um, we saw that Docker was supported with Windows, and, and there were some rumors that Docker might be one of the new concepts for future um, Azure um, roles. But at least for for this um, this, this first iteration, and, 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 and as far as you can see, at least, we can see that Azure websites will be used as the the vehicle, the runtime for the microservices. What we also can see is that um, it's focused on business capabilities, and I'll have a little demo later on where we can see that um, what they might be um, focusing on. So it's a gallery that you will get with codeless services, um, and you will be able to compose your own things with that. Uh, microservices will be separately and independently upgradable. So the dependencies between all of that is also something that we need to um, have a look at. The centralized management, uh, that's the API gateway. So I will dive a little bit deeper later on, um, but the API gateway is one of the most important um, concepts. You might make a comparison with um, the message box or the messaging agent uh, of this talk. And the programming, the programming languages, um, that's what I talked about, that the, the website supports. So you can deploy websites in Node.js, PHP, C Sharp, the language of your own um, choice. Okay, now, um, a little bit of animation, animation that I didn't create myself, um, but that was just to position everything, where we can say that the, um, yeah, the containers, the hosting, that was the website, and that's really building on a solid foundation. Um, it's proven cloud scale, so they have a lot of um, customers worldwide using these websites, and that will be the next um, runtime, so your microservice will map one-on-one -on -one with a website. That's important. And probably the most important point of this slide, in my opinion, is the fact that, um, and that's the fifth one, that you can have that website's concept running on-prem with Azure Pack. 
And that's also one of the things that we saw in that um, presentation in, 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 in the grade that uh, microservices um, yeah, is intended to have a symmetric version um, through the windless edge of packs. So everything we can see coming up in the cloud might and probably will be available later on on-prem through the Windows Edge of Pact. Of course, there's a delay in, in, in deployment latencies, but um, that's important. What we also see is that API management is highly important. Um, you have all these different microservices. Um, it's important that you can manage them and that for the microservices gateway that there's built-in API management, not only on the design time where you can manage everything, but also on the runtime where, for example, throttling um, can be important. So whoever thought that the throttling um, settings of BizTalk would disappear in the future, well, we can see throttling probably coming back, but in a different um, jacket. Um, you can also see that authentication and analytics will be part of that. Um, so what one of the points that uh, Microsoft made during the summit was that they tried to aim that API management that is now really seen as an independent service, um, that that might be more embedded and, and included with the websites and, and the, the microservices. That's important to, um, to understand it as well. Um, what's also important, and that's where the bingo comes in again, um, that they want to provide a lot and a lot and a lot out of the box microservices, um, focusing on standard protocols um, and of course on SaaS applications. Um, these will be available through the marketplace. Um, so Microsoft aims to, um, I think they stated to have at least 100 different connectors, um, but of course they will open it up for the, um, yeah, for the ecosystem. So partners should be um, able to build their own um, uh, adapters or connectors, whatever it will be called, and provide that through the um, gallery. Yeah. What's also important is that um, the BizTalk team, they are not building that microservices engine. They are using the microservices engine that is built by another team, probably the websites team together with some other people who have their focus on this microservices architecture. And the BizTalk team will just focus on what they do best, and that's everything that is around integration. So that, and you see it here, validation, batching, um, protocol conversion, format mapping, um, extract, transform, so the pipelining things, business rules, um, EDI and all of that. So all of these things will be built upon this framework. And that's if you make a comparison with BizTalk services as we have seen it um, until now, the, the, let's, let's call that the, v, uh, the V1. There we could see that Microsoft, uh, that the Microsoft BizTalk team was building the engine, was building the tooling, the SDK, was building um, the, these actual um, services that we see on this slide. Um, and they were doing, doing that all with themselves in a smaller team. What we can now see is that they are doing less with the same team and all the rest the real engine is, let's say, outsourced um, from India to US if you want, where you have a bigger team that is focusing on this um, engine. And that's, in my opinion, a, a very good step um, towards the scaling of that team. Okay. And of course, if you have all these microservices, What's also important is that you can compose them together and build your yeah, business logic. So you will be able to have your workflows uh, running um, and to orchestrate all these microservices together. So of course there's support for, um, for uh, long running processes and things like that. And you will have rich logging and all, um, but I'm not sure yet on how complex the, the workflows can be. Um, and you will see that later on when I show a screenshot, um, you will be able to make um, some kind of mapping, okay? What's also important is that um, they will provide, let's say, an out-of-the-box complete experience. So this, and that's important, this BizTalk team is not just um, focused on BizTalk, the microservices. It's part of a bigger exercise where they want to build a complete um, experience towards the business user, and that's important. If you think back on that um, on that definition of microservices, you could see that there was a focus on the yeah, business capabilities instead of pure technical um, um, capabilities. And one of the things that we could see coming back quite a lot was this thing called Project Siena. Um, until uh, probably 
um, end of December last year. I didn't know anything about Siena except that it's one of the nice cities in Tuscany in, uh, in Italy. Um, but apparently it's a project that is um, already quite a long time in, in, in beta or, or, or preview version. Um, and you can just download it. And that's what I want to give as a demo because I, I cannot demo the microservices thing because it's not available as a public preview yet. So we don't have our hands on it, but still I wanted to give at least a little demo to show you where they see um, Siena coming back because this name here, that's something you, you keep seeing back um, later on in these, in these um, um, presentations. So if I open this thing and you can just download it from the, um, from the uh, marketplace, or the, the app, um, what's it called, the market, the store, yeah? you can just open Siena, Microsoft Project Siena. And this is a V1, and I, I heard they are building a new um, tool. Um, so, and that's, if you make the analogy with um, the past, you could say that this is probably um, what Access was built, uh, was used for. That was, you know, a lot of business users are building their own applications years and years without anyone in the IT knowing about it. And then suddenly it had to be supported because that one business guy had to um, leave the company and, and they saw that the entire business was running on that, on those access databases. Well, that might be a similar thing where they can give um, to the business users some capabilities to build their applications. And, and one of the things that I want to show here is, for example, this thing. This is just... A, very basic API that will just return the a list of the water level measures. So I will get a water level from my um, water level tank, uh, the rainwater, um, to see you know the evolution of the day. It has it rain and all of that, and that will be you know um, returns as as the output. So what I can just do, I can just publish this to uh, Azure. It takes like 10 seconds and my application is, uh, or let's say my website is um, being published. If you wait a little bit and there it was. And I have it open here if you want. So this is my, and it's not secured because it's read only and I didn't have too much time. But this is the, um, the API that returns the water level measures of um, today. Um, and what I will now be able to do is build this application in Siena. And for that, what I need to do, and that's something that we all will have to um, learn over the time. And you cannot see my second screen, but I'm opening this tool that will um, pop up here. Yeah, I'm opening this tool here, Waddle Generator. So Waddle, that's just one letter different from Wizzle. So this allows you to to document your um, API. So there's add-ins and, and through Nugget packages, you can create automatically Waddle um, documentation for your APIs, but you can also with this one um, create it yourself. So what I can do, I can just give my service a name, water level tank service or API. I click next. I can specify the security. So as you can see, I didn't have any, but you can have OAuth um, if you need that. And then I can say, okay, let's add these functions. Read water level. I can give the URL. That's the URL of my service. He automatically detects this as, let's say, the base service and says, okay, if you call this one, that, that will be mapped to this function, yeah? The request body in this case was empty, but I could, for example, say, okay, I want to add some parameters. And then I can just give it a try and I can see that I get back the JSON. If I now click Add Function, I can click Next. I could add more functions, so more of my um, API um, resources. And I can now just say, I will export this to, in this case, this file. I will replace it. So what I did now, I created a VADL, so that the, the service description language of my API, so let's call it Web API description language, and that the you have a similar thing which is called Swagger. So they are much cooler than j just by pronouncing them. Um, but this thing can be then used by um, Siena. And that's what I will do now. So if I now open Siena, 
I right click, I say, okay, I want to use data. I can use from all these things, I can add show my Facebook friends, which I won't do today because this is recorded. Um, and I can say, okay, just import data. And here I have this file. So it's um, in Belgium, it's uh, close to nine. Um, so let's open this one. And you can see that there's one function. I can give it a try. And you can see that this is the level that I have. So if I now go back, um, what I can do here, I have these visuals. So I can use, um, for example, galleries and things like that. I will show a, sh a chart, a line chart. And I can just start dragging and dropping. I won't spend too much time with um, these details, but what I can easily do, I click on the chart and I can select my data set. So I, here on the left, I have my water tank um, API. Um, I will say read the water level. And that's what you will have to do. And I can immediately see that this morning and of course, I can spend more time in the, in the, um, you know, in the details of these labels. But I can see at this morning, um, this is probably where it started to rain at uh, during the night, and this is probably where we took some showers, and this is where it started to rain in this afternoon. Yeah. What I can then do, I can just say, okay, let's publish this application and so on. And then I can just publish this application as an as a application to even, um, even Android, um, Windows Phone and all, because there will be Sienna players on those mobile platforms where you can just um, hook into these things. Now, what does this have to do with microservices? And what does this have to do with, um, with uh, the BISOP? Well, what I'm trying to um, show is that this on the right, will also probably contain um, things from the Azure gallery in the next versions. And from there, you will be able to drag and drop stuff. Um, for example, uh, a web service or a, a microservice that is provided by other users that don't have anything to do with, um, with this stuff. So they will just provide web services maybe to get um, navigation or maybe to get some some basic lookups. So this is more for visualization. This is not really intended for transactional application. But having that capability, and I can just do a preview and use this um, application, but having that capability, um, that's something that that is a big change um, because in the future we might see this coming to the um, to the integration world itself, where also business or at least more functional users um, will be able to build at least lightweight integration. And that's one of the the positive things that I see and that I will talk about later, but that's also one of the challenges that I see because um, we all know what happens with um, the freedom that business users um, suddenly get um, and the way they sometimes um, handle that freedom, right? So that's something that um, we definitely have to follow up. Anyway, that was, um, okay, ignore this one. So this was just to show that um, concept. Let's go back to that presentation. And I hope, yeah, everyone should see my screen again. Um, so I wanted to show that Sienna thing because what we see there will come back in these um, screenshots that um, we got on the summit. So one of the things was this workflow portal. Um, and if you look at, this is just a screenshot that we had because we don't have access yet, but this workflow portal um, allows you to drag and drop. Uh, on the right here, you have a microservices gallery, let's say. So you could drag and drop microservices, for example, a Twitter search, a Facebook search, and things like that, send an email, and, um, and you have a, tri uh, a trigger. So that's important. Every one of those workflows starts with a trigger. This trigger, in this case, is a, a scheduled one. So no more scheduled task adapter. Um, but you can also have um, some, let's, let's call it perceiver or connector activity. For example, this could start when a message arrives on a queue or when a file arrives in this database or maybe when someone calls this endpoint. So that's the thing. You can just pr press the run button and this workflow runs and you can follow where the steps are. So you can see here that he is in these two steps collecting the data and so on. Um, 
So this is yeah very user friendly you can call it and and this is still uh, an early preview so we can assume and hope that this even gets more um, yeah designed out um, and that's the type of workflows that we also saw there okay? so this is this allows you to very easily build a workflow um, and it also looked like the, uh, that this was the only designer, the only IDE that you would have, so that you couldn't even have this in Visual Studio Design, or you would have to use JSON. And that's something that I'll come back uh, later on. Um, then this is another screenshot of the um, B2B portal. So the B2B portal that we know from, um, from BizTalk Services, they will take all that functionality and move it to the new Azure portal. So that looks uh, more like this. So the Azure portal, if you've played with that, the new one, um, it takes some time to get used to it. But once you find your way in it, and once you get, you know, to learn the the, the details, um, it's pretty useful. So that's um, one of the things you can see here. You can create agreements with all the settings. Um, so that will be part of that same um, portal experience. And one of the things that they also showed was the, the, the business rules. So business rules would look a little bit like this, where I could create a new microservice, um, a rule microservice, enter some, let's say, policy details. You can specify a vocabulary and a policy with all the rules here. And it looks like the rules might be uh, much more easier to copy paste and all of that. Um, again, this was, as far as I remember, um, only um, uh, mocking. So I don't think they had that um, back in the December timeframe as a, let's say, as live bits at that time, okay? Now, so far for the um, the positioning, if we now dive a little bit deeper and look behind the scenes um, on, on microservices, what we can see is that um, there will be microservices provided through the gallery, the ones that we um, that I talked about, for example, the SaaS connect connectors, uh, the, all these, um, the, the bingo connectors, let's call them. Um, then you also have code activities where you can write your own activities. So you can build for your customers act, um, workflows that might use um, activities from the gallery or services from the gallery. And you can inject your own custom uh, microservices as well. Right? The hosting, and that's important, the hosting is an Azure website and that was called Azure App Container. And that runs in an enterprise global scale. Um, and then the, the gateway, and that's where I'll be talking um, about most of the, um, the coming um, time. But the gateway, that's really where you can see that, um, yeah, that's the messaging agent or the, the message engine. That's where all the security, the, the name resolution and all of that, that's where everything of that is, um, is managed and done, yeah? What I want to do is just give, um, because again, this is, um, just the mock-up that they shared. Um, this is how you could, for example, um, publish pub publish your own um, microservice. So where you just write your own um, yeah, operation in your API. So this could be ASP.NET Web API, and that would probably be the most obvious choice for most of us, as we are um, probably mostly .NET and, and C# -sharp oriented. But you can have your Node.js, PHP, whatever language. Um, to, to, to have this and they will, as they do mostly, they will have SDKs for all of um, that. And if you install that SDK, what you will be able to do is um, in that project, add a microservice definition. And that's what you can see here. So that microservice definition, that is used later on um, for you to specify um, some details. Um, so you will specify the, the ID, a name, um, the author, so who um, who owns that service, and the description. Um, you also have a, a version. So that's the thing that will be visible in the gallery for people to search on. What's also important is that um, you can specify the metadata endpoint, um, and there you can see it's um, Swagger oriented. So that's the the other way where um, Ladle is having a pretty similar thing for. Um, with Wizzle, Swagger is more JSON oriented. But anyway, that's another um, standard, if you can call it a standard, um, for web APIs um, to document. Right? Um, and everyone always says, oh, WCF was so complex. Well, I can tell you one thing. 
getting metadata um, through Swagger or Rattle from ASP.NET Web API is way more complicated than just having a little endpoint um, with your um, WCF service. So I'll be the last one to say that um, WCF was um, complex on that point. Anyway, what you can do, um, if you publish that microservice definition, you can say that, and, and he scans, or this wizard will scan your web config, and they will say, okay, let's take these app settings, and you can specify that they have to be copied to a template. So for example, here you will say, okay, these two app settings, I won't make that visible in the template. I will just keep this value, let's call it hard-coded as part of my, um, my service package. But these four properties that I have here, so these will be configurable by the end user, by the, the, the user of my microservice. So if I specify that these four will be um, configurable, they will get this default value that is in my web config, but they will be able to override that at, um, uh, let's, let's call instantiation time. Whenever I have done that, there will be the, um, that, that metadata definition will be there, and then you can publish it. And just as I just published my web API to the Azure website, here I'll be able to publish it to the Azure Microservices Gallery. The details on um, how do you have to log on there, can everyone publish to the Microservices Gallery, and so on, that's not clear for me. Um, so we will have to wait for that. Uh, and I'll definitely have a challenge uh, later on um, with that. So that, um, the, the, at least the mocking, the thing that they have uh, in mind where you can just publish um, your um, APIs, your um, microservices to that gallery. And now that's where the, the fun starts. That's, that's what we want to um, um, learn about. And that's because we all know about the message box and all of that. That's something that will be important. Um, and that's um, what we will find in the microservices gateway. But before we get there, what we have to do, um, you have these two things. You can have the role where I say, okay, I'm an ISV. I have this very nice microservice in mind. Maybe you have, um, I don't know, you, you can generate PDFs out of um, EDI. And you can say, okay, this is a nice um, microservice. So you build that in Visual Studio here on the left. And then you say, okay, let's publish that one um, to the microservice gallery. Now, what's important here, and that's something that a lot of people didn't see or, or didn't pay attention um, for, but that microservice gallery, that seems to be Nougat-based. So if you're not familiar with Nougat, you probably um, should get familiar with that. So Nougat is, the, let's say, the package distribution system um, where you can get all those um, redistributables. Um, not only from Microsoft, but also from the ecosystem of partners. So it seems that there will be a separate Nougat stream or something where you can publish your microservices. And that's probably where the authentication will happen and where you have to, I don't know, maybe qualify or, or be able to, to at least push your um, services. So once these services um, have been published, there will be a sync between that gallery and the Azure Marketplace. Um, Again, details on how do you get built, um, what do you have to do in order to get um, publication. Um, nothing is clear there, at least not um, to the outside. I hope internally they, they at least have a good idea. And then, of course, um, that's where it starts uh, or it stops here um, when you're a publisher of microservices. Um, here you switch hats, as from here on the right, and you start provisioning um, your um, own business, your logical apps, your, your workflows, whatever. And that's through the Azure portal. So in that portal, you will be able to create a resource group. And if you're not familiar with that, you probably should um, get a look at the new um, Azure portal because that's all based around resource groups and the Azure Resource Manager. So if you say, okay, I want to now start creating, uh, I want to start creating a new workflow using different um, microservices. What you can do is you create a new resource group and you say, okay, I will drag and drop from that gallery several microservices. You can drag and drop your own um, microservices that you have directly deployed um, and so on. As soon as you do that and as soon as you, let's say, deploy it, 
behind the scenes for every resource group, because we are in this same box, for every resource group, there will be a gateway instance deployed. So gateway instance seems to be just another API, but that will be, let's say, pushed and deployed with your, um, with your resource group. Um, and that's the thing that will come and that will um, be provided by, let's say, the Microsoft provisioning thing. All the rest, that's what you own. So you will be able to inject custom codes to have your workflow definitions and all of these things. What's also important that, and we are still in that same box, you can add other dependent services. So if one of your custom workflows requires a SQL backend, or maybe even a Hadoop or whatever you need, queues and all of that, you should be able to make them part of this resource group. And that will be important for deployment because you can deploy these things as dependent um, concepts um, for yourself, yeah? And of course, it will be important to connect to on-prem and third-party applications. That's within microservices that you will get for connectors. The on-prem story, let's say the hybrid from cloud to on-prem, um, they didn't make any new announcements uh, on the summit. What they did mostly was um, yeah, talk about the existing artifacts they had. So the BizTalk adapter service, they have hybrid connections, which is supported from website. So you could say that at, as from day one, you could connect using hybrid connections at least. You have virtual networking support for websites. So that's also one of the things you have and so on. So that's the on-prem um, connectivity where no real new things were announced because if, if we are, um, if we're honest, I think the, the story was already pretty good there. And then you will be able to use your apps. That could be a web application, your desktop application, and here we have it again, Sienna, um, to, uh, to expose your applications and your logical um, apps to the outside, yeah? So that's the um, overall picture there. Now, if we drill down in the microservices gateway, what we can see, is that it will do um, a lot of things and a lot of things that might be, let's say, similar um, to what we know that the messaging agent of BizTalk is doing. So anyone who calls from the outside to a microservice, for example, um, my PDF generator service, they will not call that service directly. No, they will go through this gateway and the gateway will um, get that request and will forward it. And that's the name resolution. They will forward it to the right um, PDF signer. If I have some storage that needs to be shared, for example, with all the settings. I remember that in the template of my wizard, I specified some settings to be provided by the user at deployment time. That, that will be stored in the isolated storage that, um, that is shared. Same thing for shared configuration. So there's out of the box standard things available there. Of course, if you want to have your uh, microservice depending on other things, you can do that as well because you deploy that, that microservice um, on your own, right? But the microservice gateway provides at least these things out of the box. These are the things that we all know from um, the, the API management. So security, API logging and monitoring um, and transforming API definition. That's not really clear for me, but I'm assuming that you will have some out of the box transformation between the output of service A and the input of service B because you drag from one line to the other and, and yeah, not, not every service will have the same, let's call it contract or, or resource type. So that's important to understand. And then you have the identity um, items where you have secure tokens to um, store and all of that. You have key vault. I don't know if that will be linked with that. You have um, the AD and thing that is definitely important. So that's, a, that's something we have to um, dive a little bit um, deeper in. A little bit of a review of what the gateway is doing. So discovery logging Billing is important. So if I deploy my service to the uh, marketplace and people are using that, um, I probably have to be built. Um, or I can say, no, this is a free service because whatever the reason. Um, so that billing um, goes through that gateway. Right? Automatic updates. That's also one of the yeah, interesting things. Imagine that you are using my service and I find, um, if we, I'll go a little bit back here. If I have published in this NuGet my PDF generator and I find an issue with that, a bug, someone is reporting a bug, um, and I publish a new service, if that would be a successful service and there would be a lot of resource groups deployed at different instances of customers that I don't even know about, 
but I want those customers to at least get in the, that fix deployed. And it seems that that will be possible um, through the automatic updates feature. So my service will probably be able to auto update um, on that gateway. Again, details, because you could, you could see some risks. I want to test that upfront and all of that. Details on that are not clear. I, I hope and I assume you will be able to disable that feature and say, okay, I want to update that myself on the, um, on the test stage and so on. Eh? But at least it's something that for um, the lightweight integration workflows, that could be very beneficial. Um, the isolated storage, that's what I talked about. And then the metadata thing. So if you um, support those uh, metadata things like Swagger or Waddle, that's important because as you've seen, Sienna and Workflow, they depend on that. So if I build a workflow from the microservices, they depend on the, the metadata that is exported. And that's probably that transformation thing that was mentioned um, in the past. This is one of the few and probably <laughs> only pieces of code that were part of that presentation. So where you can just see how the isolated storage seems to work. So if I want to get access from my <coughs> microservice to the, to the isolated storage, I should be able to just use this um, isolated storage interface um, and read and write from these um, settings. So they will have probably for all these capabilities that I showed, discovery, logging, and all of that, they will probably have an interface where I can, from my API, if that API, let's say, is referencing the, I don't know how it will be called, the, the microservices gateway, SDK, whatever, I will be able to access these things and, and use that from, um, from the code, yeah? Now, security will be um, highly important. Um, it seems that uh, the gateway will be acting as the proxy. So you will, you will be able to specify all your APIs as preview, uh, as private, sorry, so that no one is able to call that API directly. Um, what you can do, of course, um, you can still override it to have public. But in most cases, because you probably want to have the billing and things like that um, going, you want to have your throttling and, and so on, you will um, go through that gateway, yeah? Um, they seem to have support for Azure Active Directory and act on behalf um, application secrets. So you will be able to, to store these uh, encrypted, you know, the API keys that we all know and um, that you have to use. And RBAC, um, if you haven't watched uh, a presentation of Azure in the past uh, year, you might uh, not know what that means. That's role-based access control. Um, so that's a big deal in the new portal. Um, and that portal um, supports um, RBAC. So you will be able to say, okay, this service is accessible by this guy or not. Um, that's what it um, looks like at least, yeah. Then you have the monitoring where you can um, have a look at all the installed applications. Um, that's, that's uh, the, let's call it the runtime API management where you can see all the traffic coming to your microservices. You can see the performance details, um, uptime and crashes. So that's really an important thing and on, on the health of your uh, application. Um, I don't know how that will be related with um, operational insights uh, and so on, but that's something to have a, a look for, yeah. Now, um, what's important is that I just based myself on what I've uh, learned on that integration summit. I based myself on um, reading in detail um, in the slides um, that were available on the on the Integrate 2014 website. Um, so therefore, please take this with a big disclaimer that um, there might be some things wrong or I ha might have misinterpreted things. Um, we will definitely have to find out later on. Um, but what's important is that I shared my initial thoughts. Um, and first of all, I'd like to map some concepts. The things that we know from BizTalk server on the left, and how will they map, as far as I see it again, um, to BizTalk microservices? Um, and if you've paid attention, we could even have a quiz probably, but um, the messaging engine, I think I stated that several times, but that will probably map to the gateway. Um, then the binding files. Actually, I didn't dive too much uh, into those details, but remember that I said that everything that you deploy, all your workflows, all your um, yeah, all your related activities, um, they are an Azure resource um, group. So a binding file will be an 
Azure Resource Manager template. So if you have your workflow that, for example, picks up a file from Twitter, uh, from, no, you cannot pick up files from Twitter, Sam, um, picks up a file from an FTP and then sends it to an SAP um, folder, um, that could be a template that you deploy. And on that template, you can specify your settings. And that will be, um, let's, let's say, the new binding files. And they are not in XML, they are in JSON. The good thing is that that is part of Azure by default. So this is not BizTalk specific, not microservices specific. This is um, out of the box um, Azure. And that's an important uh, advantage in my opinion. The deployment tool, that's Azure Resource Manager. Adapters seem to be connected microservices, whatever they will be called, because that's not clear. Pipelines, yeah, they talked about validation, extract, um, all of that. So they will be provided by the BizTalk team as microservices. One of the things that I would love to see is that they would have the bridges from BizTalk um, services 1.0 to have, let's say, a bridge as a microservice so that I can take a bridge, have all that functionality in one microservice and publish that. I don't know if that will be um, reality, but that would be a, a nice thing to have. Because then you have all the pipeline logic in one microservice, which is which you could consider as a business capability and not having to dive into the details of, I want to have flat file transformation, I want to have this and this and this, and you have five microservices just to parse that one incoming file. Right? And then, then you would have not the, the business logic anymore. Anyway, to be found out. Um, the transformation thing, I didn't show that because I didn't find that screenshot, um, but transformation, um, you can do transformation in the portal. So I think Sandro um, just released his uh, mapper book. And I think <laughs> whenever he saw these announcements, he was um, yeah, seeing a lot of work coming um, up to him because it seems that the mapper will be moved to the portal. Um, but the good thing is it will be based on the same logic. So on the same um, mapper files or, 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 uh, or so. Um, and then some people in the audience asked, hey, what about the transformation in Visual Studio? Can we still have Visual Studio support? And I think from the answer, it was clear that at least that was not the intention to have, but it could be a, a possibility because it's using the same technology. So they said it might be a possibility to do. And so we have to look out and, and uh, see what's coming there. And then the business rules and trading partner management they seem to be um, also available um, in the microservices um, portal. Yeah. Now, um, I started my previous presentations on this um, because I gave it internally and called it um, in the BizTalk user group in Belgium. I started it with the goods um, and ended with the challenges. I'll try to switch because I always, I think it's better to end with a positive note. So that's why I start here with some challenges in my opinion. So where I see that where the microservices gate, uh, the microservices concept, in my opinion, is very nice. I see a lot of challenges specific to integration because, I mean, we, we've all been doing integration for the past years. Um, so the messaging engine itself, that's, in my opinion, one of the biggest challenges. Um, what we haven't seen um, is, for example, how will they handle batching? Um, so it's HTTP between one service and the second service. So how does the message flow from one to the other? Is that streaming? Do you have transactional behavior? Well, if everything internally is HTTP, as far as I understand, that's not a possibility. Right? However, on the batching and the debatching, um, and I think Charles mentioned that also last week or in the Q&A or something, they made a statement that that will be supported. So we have to look out for a lot of things. These are um, questions. I'm not saying that it won't be supported. I'm, I'm just curious how it will be supported. Yeah. What's also there is that yeah, the complex scenarios that we know, um, complex workflows. Um, you saw that screenshot some slides earlier. Um, I'm not sure if that screenshot, uh, if, if those workflow designers are, um, will also be working for the more complex scenarios where we have correlation, long running things and so on. Or is it built more for the IFTTT thing? Like if this, then that. Um, that's to be found out. Will they have that one tool that supports both the complex scenarios and the lightweight integration scenarios? And I think um, 
I saw some questions internally already um, in, in some advisory groups. Um, that's one of the challenges that will um, come up um, over time. Also, in order processing, um, what about that? What about these things? Um, do they have state between that? Can can you can you persist and resume? You know, that's not clear, and that's that's all to be found out. Again, probably we will, but I'm just curious to see how that will um, end up. The other things that um, I had some questions about was the granularity. Um, in one of the previous screenshots, you could see, ah, let's create a new business rules microservice. And that was just a new business rule, and that would result in a microservice. Um, in the demos we saw, we could see that, for example, picking up a file from an FTP location on server A was a different microservice instance than picking up a file from server B. And I know quite a lot of customers um, in our, let's say, um, portfolio that have um, yeah, around 1,000 uh, or more um, receive locations or, end, or send ports, and maybe 1,000 or 2,000 transformations. And if you would, if all of those would map to one instance of a microservice, you could end up with having yeah, at easily 1,000 and more uh, microservices deployed. And that's actually 1,000 ASP.NET websites deployed in your Azure resource groups. Um, I'm curious to see how that will map and how that will um, will result for your for your building, for example. Um, that's something that I'm curious about. The other thing is the tools and the management. So it seems that they had nice um, tooling experience. I'm just um, curious because everything seems to be web portal based, um, and still a lot of developers um, love Visual Studio.NET. And of course, how will that integrate with the ALM story? Um, can I version control these things? Is there version control support through the portal if I change my workflow and so on? So again, questions that, um, that we have to um, look out for. And then we have the business user empowerment. Um, and you will see it coming back in the advantages. Um, but what I see is that having business users um, Creating business applications is what is one thing, especially if they are read-only. I don't care too much about that um, because that's a good thing. You can give the flexibility to those guys to just, you know, consume data streams or data streams, whatever, and build their own um, dashboarding things. But um, having them writing transactional applications, workflows, that's another thing. So also because it has to be, um, yeah, solid. Um, tested and all of that. So that's definitely a challenge that I see um, for the enterprise scenarios. And then, of course, the billing model. Um, imagine that you have this gallery. And again, probably all of that will be tackled whenever they go live by um, some good rules. But that gallery that has all these microservices, um, imagine that there's four different partners submitting um, services. Um, then you have some open source guys who also submit some services, just, let's say, free of charge, but probably not supported. And then you have some Microsoft services. Um, if I'm a business user, uh, a company, and I drag and drop from that gallery, I want to know for each and every microservice that I'm using in my probably um, critical um, applications, I want to know if that's a supported one. I want to know who should I call. Um, is there an SLA behind that? Um, so that's an important aspect. And then, of course, the billing model. Um, that partner that publishes his commercial service with an SLA, they will probably want to get some money. And again, it depends on the type of service. If you have a service that just, I don't know, does a transformation, I can imagine that um, bill per execution makes a lot of sense because you just execute and, and you return something. But imagine that you have an archiving service where you need to store documents for tens or more of years, yeah, then the cost is not necessarily the, the time, the number of times you call it, but probably the duration of that um, archiving and the size of that message. Will that will will it be possible um, to have, a, let's say, a, a clear, simple billing model that supports all of these scenarios? That's to be found out. And then we have these um, last slides, and that's the positive notes. That's what I love about it. Um, um, working for a partner, 
I obviously love the fact that they will open up a lot of things for the partner ecosystem. What it seems that, um, that it looks like is that you will be able to publish your microservices and have other end, con end consumers or users that you probably don't even know and maybe don't even have direct contact or contract with um, consuming your services. So that seems to be a very interesting thing. Um, I see a lot of things coming um, out of that. Then the fact that you have small unit of deployment. So you have your microservices um, as websites. What you can do is you can just scale it up and down. What, um, and that's the, the next thing. So if you have these different uh, workflows, what you could say, um, because there's different tiers in websites, you have the free, the basic, and the standard, I assume. You could say <clears throat> um, this, I don't know, this um, production uh, critical system, um, I will scale it up to a standard running on four different machines. And then you could say, okay, these workflows are running on dedicated machines. These other lightweight things that I only need for my business users, um, whenever that Salesforce opportunity is, um, I don't know, um, one that there should be an email sent, whatever. Um, yeah, that's something that I can have a lower scale. So you have, you you seem to have a lot of flexibility and a lot of scalability um, on your deployments. Whereas we were linked to the hosts and hosts instances for BizTalk services. Now you will be able to scale and and tune uh, on microservice level, and that's important. Yeah. The extensibility is definitely important. So the extensibility where you can add and inject and do um, your custom web services or, or microservices. And of course, the business user empowerment. So I saw it as a challenge, but I also see it as, as, as a, an interesting concept where you can have very easy, um, quick um, setup of workflows without having to know too much about BizTalk. And there I really talk about those lightweight workflows. For example, if my um, uh, opportunity is one, then I want to do this. Uh, maybe I I want to schedule this report every um, day to that user. You know, those type of workflows, um, you don't want to have too much. Um, yeah, you want to have the, the business user to be a little bit of uh, free and, and innovative there. So that, that's one of the um, advantages. And the deployment model. Um, Unfortunately, I cannot see, let's say, a show of hands, but if I would ask who likes the BizTalk deployment model, I don't think there will be a lot of uh, hands up. Um, with this, I'm not saying it will be um, much better, but at least we will be in the same um, ship now, in the same boat as all the other microservices, uh, as all the other Azure um, um, services. So people who build websites, people who publish, um, I don't know, API management, whatever they publish outside of the BizTalk niche, they will have that same deployment model. So it's not a BizTalk specific deployment model anymore. You have um, one deployment model for your website, your databases, your queues, and your BizTalk microservices. And that's definitely an uh, advantage. Yeah. And then we have that um, last one that is probably one of the biggest important uh, aspects. Um, from BizTalk Services 1.0, I never heard that there would be um, a symmetric version on-prem. Here, from the very first day, when we saw that first microservices thing on the slides, they said that they will provide the same runtime, the same capabilities on-prem through the Windows Azure or the Microsoft Azure pack, um, which is called MAP, which is good for an integration thing. So that's something that's important um, to see. Um, there will be symmetry, and that's important for um, for enterprise customers and to, to see that it's not just the cloud, it's innovating in the cloud and bringing back those capabilities on-prem, yeah? All right, last slide. Um, before we start some questions, that's how you can get started. And again, this is just, let's say, my advice. Um, I'm not sure about this, but this is what I would say and what I actually said to some people in our company. Um, yeah, first of all, follow up on all the announcements. Um, even if you were not on the um, Integrate 2014 event, you can see a lot of um, presentations, a lot of um, also captured uh, videos on site, uh, on, on the site, I mean. So you can really look into those details and just follow up on the announcements. If you're not on Twitter, maybe you should 
you know, get on it and, and you will definitely see things coming there. Now that's the easy part. Um, the other things are probably looking into those new standards. And we all know, I mean, we cannot write it, but at least we understand the purposes of uh, RISDL. Well, at least we should look into those uh, other things like Swagger and Rattle. Um, and then, yeah, who would have thought about that, that Bistol guys had to learn about Azure websites? That was probably the like, oh yeah, we have uh, Azure websites, we can host a WordPress thing. Yeah, next, next, finish. It seems that one of the core um, cloud components for the integration world will be running on um, Azure websites. And that's an important one um, to follow up. At least the scaling and all of that, the auto scaling, uh, important aspects of uh, websites, at least have a look and understanding of that. Then API management, um, it's a very interesting service. Um, we are looking and working closely together with that team. Um, it's a promising service, it's not there yet, but having those capabilities out of the box into your microservices websites, that's definitely a good uh, advantage. And then I know for a lot of us, including me, it's not easy. It's not easy seeing those challenges. It's We can see a lot of problems coming up. Um, but we also have to think, let's say, outside the box. We have to think a little bit innovative, a little bit, you know, seeing the, the opportunities and not just the, the challenges and the um, things that will come. It will take some time, um, but never forget that we at least at this point have BizTalk server on-prem that most of us are using and are still using. And that's what I said internally, um, by the end of next year or this year, um, most of our customers will still be running on BizTalk server, but at least we have a much clearer understanding of you know, the microservices thing. And we have that good um, roadmap, at least that's what I hope. Yeah. Um, again, everything that I said was my perception, my interpretation. Things can be wrong, um, but don't hesitate to um, talk about that uh, with me. Um, I suggest that now we can switch to, um, to some questions. Um, I probably have to switch to that URL unless no one was using that. 